Hi, welcome to Bruce Connection. I'm um, really glad you're here today. I want you to turn to the book of Titus. Book of Titus, uh, back in the end of the, towards the rear of the New Testament, and find chapter three, okay? Titus chapter three. Because in these verses, we're going to, to find, or we can look at at least, God's plans to change our lives and what he has in store and how he wants to change them. It's very interesting. Let's pick it up verse one, read down through verse eight, and we'll come back and talk about some stuff. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness of the love of God, when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Look at verse three again. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Uh, that's just a, a definition of, of the way these people were uh, that, that uh, Paul is writing to before they received Christ. Uh, that's the way we were be before we received Christ. That's, that's the story of of, of our lives. We, we look at the world around us and we see what's going on and we, we see the hatred. I've never seen so much hatred. So much of it just based on cultural thoughts and, and uh, uh, political views and uh, just, it's, it's so incredible. Families being torn apart. With people hating each other because of insignificant, stupid things. Then verse four says, but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared. I love that phrase. When the kindness and the love of God appeared. Why did Jesus come? He came to show us the plan of God. What was God's plan? To change us from what we were to what we could become. Now, he, he came to redeem us, of course. He came to show us mercy and grace and love and forgiveness and, and, and all of those things, absolutely. But he came to show us what we could be if we would surrender to him. Why did he come? To show us God's plan? What was God's plan? To change us. Now, we're gonna be changed when we see him in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, and we all look forward to that, and that's going to be wonderful and fantastic and glorious, and I can hardly wait. But there's also, <laughs> the Bible says that we are being changed from glory to glory as by the Holy Spirit. There's change going on every time we, from glory to glory, that means when we experience the presence of God, there is change happening in our lives. And sometimes we're not allowing that change. Sometimes we're, we're fighting that. You know, let me ask you a question. Have you ever had some plans, and these were plans you thought were, you know, of God, or you were thought they were for God, or for his kingdom, or whatever, and uh, they, they were interrupted, and they got all messed up. And it kind of looks like God is the one who messed them up. Has that, has that ever happened to you? Has happened to me. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, Pilate had a plan. I'm going to rule here in this country, and I don't. We're going to get rid of this guy, no matter what. You know, Herod had a plan. I'm going to be king. I'm going to run everything. You know, um, uh, Mary and Joseph had a plan. 
Uh, they, they had a plan. We're going to get married. I love you so much, honey. And I'm doing okay in the carpentry. When we get married after a time of, of uh, waiting and so forth. And, and uh, I'll build you a house. And I'll build a little white picket fence. And we can have, you know, two kids. And we can have a wonderful time. You know, they, they had a plan. Uh, the shepherds had a plan. You know, they were that night when the birth of Jesus was announced. Their plan was before that happened, they're going to take care of their sheep. They're going to probably get a little rest. They're going to sit around the fireplace for us. It's cold that time of year. They, they had a plan. But God kept interrupting these people, each and every one of them. You know, and, and they had these plans, but God shows up and says, no, that's not the way it's going to be. We need to understand that our prayers should never be to ch try to change God to what we think should be done. Our prayers should be, God, change me to what you want me to be, who you want me to be, what you want me to be doing. And those plans oftentimes are so totally different, you know, than, than, than what, what, what we think they should be. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've argued with God. I've argued with God about plans. I, I, when, when the church first started, I thought I knew everything. I graduated from Bible college, and he, obviously he was starting this, you know, 50 years ago, and I was kind of pretty prideful, and I thought I could do it, and I heard a lot of people, and you know, that had good intentions and wanted to help, and, and I did things over the, you know, at the beginning that hurt people, and and I have tried to apologize to all of them and I pray for them and, and uh, almost daily because I, I feel bad about, you know, all the mistakes that I made, all the, all the ideas I had and people just wanted to help and God was using people to try to help and I was ignoring all of that because I had this plan and I thought I knew what, what, what God wanted and, and uh, you know, why is God's plan so special? I mean, we have some creative abilities. I know God's a little more creative than we are, but why is God's plan so special? Why, why, why does he interrupt us and, and do things in a different way? Because his plan spares us from a whole lot of trouble. His plan spares me from a whole lot of trouble. If I'd have listened to him and gone the way he was directing from day one, it would have spared me a lot of pain, a lot of pain and hurting people and doing things and, and being criticized and making mistakes and, you know, hindering the work of God at times and just thinking that I, I knew, you know, what, what God wanted me to do. And uh, ah, now I realize that his plan is so special because when you just surrender to what he wants to do, his project, he's already worked out you know, a lot of the trouble. He's worked out this stuff and he keeps us from that, you know, and it's Proverbs sixteen twenty five says, there's a way that seems right unto man, but that leads to death. And we always have ways that seem right to us, but they lead to destruction. They, they lead to death. And we, we really need to understand that. God's plan has, has um, prepared for every eventuality. He's, every thought has been put into his plan and he knows exactly what he's doing. And, and, and you look at, 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 at Paul. Paul had a plan to destroy Christianity. God interrupted that plan. Knocked him down one day and talked to him and Paul became an incredible uh, force for the kingdom of God. Wrote most of the New Testament. God's plan was much better than Paul's plan. And the list can go on and on and on. And God's plan is always better than yours. It's always better than mine. God's plan is always bigger. <laughs> you know, Mary and Joseph's plan was, okay, we're gonna, you know, we'll, we'll have a little, little house. Jeff, you can build your car, we're gonna build a picket fence, like I said. And uh, God's plan was, I'm going to uh, plant a child in you. I'm going to do this before you ever have relationships with her, Joseph. And that child is going to change the entire world. Bigger plan than what Mary and Joseph planned. See, we've got to 
We've got to say, God, what do you want to do? Not what I want to do, but what do you want to do? He wants to be, he wants to do so much more than we can even visualize it. You know, it says that he wants to give us more than we can even ask or think of. And we, we need to, you know, uh, free him to do that in our lives. And that's for what he wants. He wants to do so much more in your life, my friend. He wants to do so much more in my life. I know that. I've spent, I, I spent too many years. My life now is, is one and it has been for a long time, but it's one that I only want God's will. I only want God's plan. I only, I only want to do what God wants me to do. I only want to do what, what, what God is doing. I don't want to do my stuff. I don't, I don't, I don't care about anything except God's plan. And, and God's plan has to do with expanding his kingdom always, has to do with expanding his kingdom, when seeing those that are lost coming to eternal life, those who are sinking in the miry clay, lifted out and washed and placed on the solid rock, Christ Jesus, his plan is always bent in that direction, always. And when we take that out of the picture and and think that's that's not the most important part of what God wants to do and everything he does in our lives. And, you know, we eventually have to come to the point where we <laughs> let him replace our plans for, for his. Second question is, why did he come? I think he came. I don't think he only came to, to um, save us, you know, uh, um, in the in the plan of God, but also to to show us His love and forgiveness. He came to forgive us. He came to save us. He came to change us. Here are some characteristics of our our lives. I jotted some jotted some things down here um, that we many times we don't let Him rule and reign in our we don't let Him rule and reign in our lives. Here's some things. We become very, very weary. Weary because we we have to walk longer and harder, work longer and harder, because when we don't rely on God's grace and love to accomplish his purpose, we are, you know, we wear ourselves out, you know, on our on our own when when God wanted to do it through us. Also when we try to to do it without him, we become angry because it isn't working. How many times, you know, you try something and I've tried something and, well, this works, worked over there, worked down the street, worked there. You know, how come it isn't working? Because God didn't tell you to do it, Chuck. We need to understand that unless God is in it, it just is not going to work at all. Think of the beauty of verse four. He appeared. That's John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. You know, that's, that's what this life is all about. The love of God appearing. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus went to the cross. That's why Jesus did everything he did while he was here. You know, the, the, the church is great and I like it, but, you know, church just can't be our focus. You know, um, teaching is great and I love it and teaching just can't be the only focus that we have. A fellowship is good and small groups are great and, and life groups are great and those are all, but that can't be the focus of what we do. You know, our buildings are great and wonderful and they seat lots of people and, and that's good and that's wonderful, but that cannot be our focus. Do you remember when Jesus wept over Jerusalem? Do you know why? Because a city of people who were mean and unkind and he knows he was the solution, and they would reject him. See what I'm saying there? 
He looks out at a city that's mean, that's unkind. And he says, I can fix that. I've reached out to them so many times. I'm the solution and they just reject me time after time after time. Finally and lastly, I, I, I think Jesus Christ came to show us our purpose. Look at verse eight. This is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. So I think he came to, to, to show us the way we have purpose. He came so we could know him and live and love like him. You know, uh, it's, it's important that we, that we totally understand that. It's important that we understand that, you know, when I say live and love like him, there's a, there's a whole lot of people around each and every one of us every day that don't know Jesus. And I am totally, completely, 100% convinced that our purpose on this planet is to expand the kingdom of God. That's our number one purpose. And I'm just asking God, you know, you build it, you do the plan. I, what, I, you do the plan in my life today when I walk out of my house, whatever I'm supposed to do. I want to live a life of love. I want to live a life of light. I want to live a life that reveals the reality of Jesus Christ. I want to speak words that bring wholeness. I want to speak words that bring life. That's what he has called us to do. And we need to understand that. That's our purpose here right now. You know, our purpose isn't to build stuff for ourselves or to look good on our own or whatever. And all that's great, I guess. But I, I believe our, our, our primary purpose and, and uh, we build stuff for this purpose also. And I know that. I'm not coming against anything. I'm just saying that our purpose must primarily be the expanding of the of the kingdom of God. He came so we could know him, live like him, and love like him. And that's not easy to do. But he'll give us the power to do that. Because he said, you shall be witnesses of me. You're gonna, you know, people are gonna see me when they see you. You'll be witnesses of me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Then you will be these witnesses. And he's filled us with this power. The moment that we ask him into our lives, the Holy Spirit lives within us and empowers us. And empowers us, and then we can be filled with his Holy Spirit that's an overflowing and, you know, that, that let him be in charge of many things and, and, and surrender to him and, and then he let him empower us to live a life, not for us to be successful, not so we can be happy, not so we can be comfortable and all those things are great. It's all part of the Christian package. It's all serendipities of, of this Christian life, absolutely. But our purpose is not to try to attain those things. Our purpose is to live a life that draws people to Jesus Christ. To live to the praise of his glory. That's what he says. We should live in such a way that people praise him and will come to know him by how we live, and what we do, and what we say. Father, I thank you for this time. I know it was just kind of a, a conglomeration of stuff, but it was thoughts that have been going on in my head, Lord, for a while. And kind of it's, when I saw this in Titus, it just made so much sense to me, Lord. And so I laid it out here with my, my friends and family today, Lord. But you're the master teacher. You're the one that will cause it to make sense in each one of our lives. We want to live with purpose, your purpose, not ours. It's in your name we pray. Amen. God bless you and uh, see you tomorrow.